As we all know, it's not a mystery. The NFL is a pass-happy league. And because of this, the nickel package of having five defensive backs on the field has almost become like a base defense. In 2014, NFL defenses had at least five defensive backs on the field for an average of 60%. That number was up from 49% in 2013, 44 in 2012, and 40 in 2011. The Detroit Lions had five or more defensive backs on the field, a staggering 76.3% of the time. That led the NFL. The old school slot cornerback wasn't asked to do more than hand off his man in zone coverages, but today, that nickel corner must play the seam, adapt to option routes, and guess on the fly. And that slot corner has become more important because teams like to exploit matchups. For example, Randall Cobb is not only the best slot receiver in the game today, he's one of the best, period. We've seen Victor Cruz and Wes Welker light it up in the past and are going to see a new crop of budding slot receivers like Jordan Matthews and Jarvis Landry take it up a notch this season. But there are some solid slot cornerbacks out there as well, like Chris Harris, Gerard Powers, some guys that might be moving outside this season, Brandon Boykin and Casey Hayward. Chris Harris, I'll get back to him in a second, but he can do a little bit of everything. So what do I look for in a cornerback? There's ball skills, instincts, closing speed, and tackling. Ball skills, playing and attacking the ball as much as a receiver would, having soft hands, having the ability to knock it away if it's uncatchable. Instincts, reading the routes of the receiver, keeping the quarterback in the corner of their eye, and getting a jump on the ball. Cover two corners must be instinctive in short areas. Closing speed, transitioning out of the back pedal, flipping the hips, taking a beeline to the football, and tackling. Obviously, if you can't break up the pass and the receiver catches the ball, you got to bring him down, but you also got to be able to fill the alleys in run support. So, Richard Sherman, Optimus Prime. He's my top right corner. Shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And for the third time in as many seasons, he's going to have another cornerback starting opposite of him. Kerry Williams is going to get targeted often. The lanky 6'3", 195-pound Sherman was thrown at just 65 times a year ago in 19, uh, 19, 989 snaps. When the ball does come his way, Sherman uses his length and soft hands to make plays on the ball. Four interceptions on 65 targets is pretty good. And he was penalized just three times all year. The quarterback passing rating when thrown at Sherman is just 48.4. That's third best in the NFL. Due to his height, he can match up against taller and bigger receivers. But his technique is also so exceptional that he can shut down the smaller and more elusive wideouts too. There's a reason why Seattle secondary is nicknamed the Legion of Boom. Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor aren't the only ones who can lay the lumber. Sherman can hit too. He puts that length to good use when wrapping up ball carriers. Darrell Revis is number two, and no other corner plays with as good technique as Revis does. Rex Ryan might be gone, but his cornerback tandem of Revis and Antonio Cromartie are back with the Jets. And Revis took advantage of the free agency system again, signing a five-year, $70 million contract, $39 million guaranteed. Wow. He'll get $16 million in base salary this year and 17 next season. The next highest paid corner this season is Patrick Peterson, who is set to make $11.7 million. He can defend any style of wideout. His range and instincts are spectacular. He can jam and reroute, and his ball skills are outstanding. He was also only flagged four times a year ago. He's not as good against the run as Sherman is, but he still sticks his nose in there. He's a willing tackler. And, you know, overall, really, really solid. There's a reason why they nickname him Revis Island, because you don't want to travel to it. Vontae Davis checks in at number three. And I don't think people people realize, you know, how good of a season he had last year. He earned his first Pro Bowl nod, led all cornerbacks in passer rating against at just 38.8. He also allowed the fewest percentage of completions at 43.7%, giving up just 31 catches on 71 targets. He's physical at the line of scrimmage, also has the quickness to shadow receivers out of their breaks. His hips are fluid, and his recovery speed is explosive. He's an excellent tackler after the catch and also as an edge run defender. Um, By far the most underrated cornerback in the game, and you can make the argument that Davis was better than both Sherman and Revis last season. Definitely. I I think so. Chris Harris is my fourth-ranked corner. 
Uh, this might be a surprise to the casual fan, but shouldn't be to the hardcore one. I mentioned that Davis led the NFL in passer rating against. Well, Harris was second at 47.8. His pure coverage skills are outstanding, and his 7.7 .7 yards per catch allowed was by far the best in the league. EJ Gaines of the St. Louis Rams was second at 9.8. And it's not like he rarely gets challenged. He plays opposite Aqib Talib. It's pick your poison in Denver. He's also equally adept at playing the inside. As I mentioned earlier, you know, great sl slot cornerback as well. He played 249 of his 1,004 snaps in the slot. And besides Davis, no other corner was better in coverage last season. Harris is an outstanding athlete, very fluid, fluid in his hips, and is fast enough to run with any receiver in the game. He just doesn't guess wrong. He isn't exactly great as a run defender, but does have the ability that you know to turn the play back inside. He's just not going to make a lot of tackles. Patrick Peterson is number five, and I must say he did not have a great year a year ago, especially for a guy who's the second highest paid cornerback in the game. He's basically top five for his you know production prior to last season. He gave up eight touchdowns, was flagged thirteen times. He picked off just three passes for a second straight year after tallying seven in 2012. I know he sees the top dog each week, and he was outstanding when he matched up with Des Bryant when the Cardinals played Dallas. But again, it was a down year for a guy with such lofty expectations. He has all the physical tools you'd love to mold a quarter, cornerback into. 6'1", 219, super athletic, runs like a deer, is a threat to take any pick to the house. He's an outstanding pure man corner when motivated. As a run, run defender, he's up and down. He loses track of the ball a lot, loses contain a lot. But when he does get in position, he takes ball carriers down to the ground. Joe Hayden is number six. And let's just say his second half of the year was a lot better than his first eight games. First half of the season, wildly inconsistent, especially his first three games. I don't think I've ever seen him look as bad as, you know, week one when the Browns played Pittsburgh, just awful. When he's on his game, Hayden always seems to be around the ball, and that's evidenced by his 20 pass breakups the last two seasons. He might be the best, best tackling cornerback in the league, which is remarkable considering his size, but Hayden's feisty. He likes to mix it up. Uh, put up a career-high 73 tackles a year ago. Tough and run support, excellent in the open field, you know, making tackles. Desmond Trufant is number seven. He's the one shining star on a woeful Atlanta Falcons defense. I mean, that thing is Swiss cheese. And his play really amazed me, considering how non-existent Atlanta's pass rush was. The Falcons were second to last with just 22 sacks, and Croy Bierman's paltry four and a half led the team. He possesses great range, speed, and instincts in man coverage. He's tough. He's tough. His hips are fluid. He's extremely confident. Doesn't have the best hands, but he's always in position to make a play on the ball. He put up 61 tackles last season. I, I think he does a solid job at defending the edge. Sean Smith checks in at number eight. Like True Font, Smith doesn't get a lot of respect nationally, but when you turn on the tape, He's a top 10 corner. He spent four seasons with the Dolphins before moving to Kansas City and has flourished in his two years with the Chiefs. He will miss the first three of the uh, first three games this season due to a D DUI. At 6'3", 218, Smith has size, power, and length and uses, uses them all to his advantage in coverage. Maybe, maybe one of the reasons why Smith gets overlooked is because he doesn't put up high interception totals. He had just one last year and has never put up more than two in a season due to his power and length smith is very good at tackling in space he had 50 a year ago although he did miss seven of them uh if there was one guy who caught my eye most and kept shocking me more and more during the video evaluating process that i do during the offseason it was xavier rhodes he's number nine i doubt anybody else would have Rhodes in the top 10 but i'm telling you guys watch the kid play he's outstanding and entering his third season, that ceiling is up here. It's high. The one glaring thing that I noticed with, with Rhodes was his improved hand usage and his ability to press at the line of scrimmage. So when you mix that with his length and speed, he locks receivers down. He's got fluid hips, shadows op opposing receivers very, very well. Um, matched up against Megatron in Week 15 last season and definitely held his own. Held him to just four catches for 53 yards. Like Smith... Rhodes is physical and aggressive in space, but he did struggle in run defense in terms of 
you know, forcing ball carriers back to the middle. Akeem Tlaib rounds out my top 10. Not a lot of cornerbacks can match Tlaib's physicality. And when he gets the press and wins at the line, you're not going to escape him. He's got a, he's, he's a long strided runner, can stick with receivers downfield. Um, one of the better run defending cornerbacks in the game. He uses his physicality and strength to take on blockers. Doesn't get pushed, you know, off his spot often. Uh, you know, really good cornerback. Guy that I've had higher in the past, but... You know, there was just some guys this year that I really liked, like Smith and True Font and, and Xavier Rhodes. You know, it was hard to put them past, you know, 10, at least in my eyes. I've got Jason McCourty at number 11, Alteron Werner at number 12, Kareem Jackson number 13, K Casey Hayward number 14, Byron Maxwell number 15, Brandon Flowers number 16, Jonathan Joseph number 17, Darius Slay, number 18, Orlando Skandrick, number 19, and Brent Grimes rounds out my top 20. Jackson got a well-deserved four-year, $34 million deal with the Texans, while Maxwell's was a lucrative six-year, $63 million pack with the Eagles. But I have Jackson ahead of Maxwell, despite the former Legion of Boom member getting a lot more money. Uh, the Eagles actually made a play at Jackson as well, but obviously he returned to Houston his ball skills aren't the best, but he plays with physicality, has good footwork, does a great job at disrupting a receiver's timing with his press coverage skills. Really curious to see how Maxwell fares because his predecessor, Brandon Browner, didn't do too hot in his lone season with the Patriots after leaving the Legion of Boom two years ago. But I also like Maxwell a lot, lot more uh, as a player than I do Browner. He has 35 and a half inch arms, which he uses his to his advantage when pressing and, and his style of play really fits what Philly wants to do because the birds basically play the same coverage scheme as Seattle does. I love Hayward at number 14. He was the slot guy in Green Bay his first three years, but with the losses of Tremont Williams and, De and Devon House, he's going to start on the outside, at least most likely. Uh, I know that Brandon Carr hasn't even come close to living up to his contract in Dallas, but feisty corner Orlando Skandrick has made up for that production. Um, you know, maybe maybe some of you Philadelphians might laugh at this, but I think he's very very solid, very solid in zone zone coverage especially, and he, he beats you with his discipline. He you know he's very versatile too. He can play inside and outside. I like Skandrick a lot. Uh, if there's a guy that's ready to take a huge leap forward this season, it's San Diego's Jason Verrett, who I have at 24. He was by far the best rookie last year, but he only played six games, which is why he's only 24. Uh, he's just 5'10", 178, but his leaping ability, timing, and skill of attacking the ball make that diminutive stature pretty much irrelevant. Uh, I'm also really curious to see how Brandon Boykin, who I have at number 29, does in Pittsburgh. He was traded by the Eagles for a conditional fifth-round draft choice, and uh, I think he's going to finally get his chance to start. For the Eagles, besides William Gay, who I have at 34, there, there's not much there when pertaining to the cornerback uh, position in the Steel City. I'm also going to have my eye on the quarterback situation in Cleveland. There's no doubt that undrafted rookie Kawan Williams played a lot better last year than first-rounder Justin Gilbert. It's reflected in my rankings, too. I have Williams at 59, Gilbert at 67, but, you know... Um, I mean, I, I know they have this approach in Cleveland, you know, that they, they put the best player out there despite, you know, uh, where you were drafted, I guess. But, um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I mean, Gilbert's the first rounder. I mean, you got to think he's going to be out there. But I, I like Williams a lot, even though he was undrafted. And what about the rookies then? Out of all the positions in the NFL, the quarterback is the second toughest transition from college to the pros, in my opinion, because there's such a learning curve. Um, because what you think is tight coverage in college, that's open in the NFL. In the college game, you play the man. In the pro game, you play the air. I like Trey Wayne's upside the most out of all the rookie cornerbacks this season. Despite him struggling in his Hall of Fame game uh, debut, he had four penalties in that game. Uh, he's number 46 on my list. I think you know he, he's a really speedy guy. I uh, can really turn his and flip his hips well, so I, I like him a lot. Some some deep, deep sleepers that many casual fans may not know but uh, may break out more this year. There, there's Ben A. Ben Wickery at 58, E.J. Gaines at 60, Marcus Burley at 63, A.J. Boye at 64, T.J. Carey at 86, and Daryl Morris at 90. 
Uh, out of out of these guys, I really like Boye a lot. Uh, he's he's out there in Houston, so uh, we'll we'll see what happens. I, I I don't know if he'll you know get a lot of snap opportunities per se, but when he is out there, he's very good. Uh, the problem is you got Kareem Jackson and Jonathan Joseph ahead of him, and you know you're you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna start ahead of those guys. But I like him a lot, and, may, and maybe he's a guy to watch out for a couple years from now uh, to be maybe a starting cornerback. Another guy I didn't mention uh, was was Darren Walls. Uh, from the Jets, I, I, I thought he had a pretty good year last year, considering the mess that was that Jets secondary. Uh, obviously, you know, clean things up this year. You got Revis and, and Cromartie back there, but um, I, I like Darren Walls too. So yeah, that's it for this video. Um, make sure you follow us on Twitter at the Bitter Birds. Debate me. You know, what's your top five? What's your top ten? What whatever uh, you know problems you have in my rankings? Let me know. You know, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't think Richard Sherman's the top corner. Maybe you like Revis. Maybe you like Vontae Davis. I don't know. Let me know. All right, I'm out of here. Later. Peace.